Welcome. My name is Scott Hamilton, uh, President and CEO of the Executive Next Practice Institute in our Next Work Strategy Division, which helps organizations get back on the right, right foot here as we enter 2022. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so a couple of quick introductions and uh, some background, some housekeeping here about what we plan to do in this uh, very fast paced hour or less. Uh, the theme for today is the critical need for a strategic retreat. Why do we need to do this now? Uh, what are the key outcomes we can expect from a well-crafted strategic retreat? And then what are the key meeting design attributes that we need to be looking at? What, how do we put this thing together? And so I, I'm going to give you the end uh, right now. I'll give you our, our uh, punchline to this entire session right up front, and that is your 90-day challenge. So take what we're talking about today, take it back to uh, your organization, uh, build a business case for having a strategic retreat. If you're not the one that makes a decision, how do you consider the implementation, the time cost, the facilitation of a strategic retreat, and who's going to be accountable, and who are the influencers that are going to make this happen? So there's your punchline for today. Now let's back into that. With the help of some experts we brought on board today, just delighted to bring in these uh, stellar thought leaders who are not only associated with ENP, but also friends. Uh, Susan Sly, of course, co-founder and co-CEO of Radius AI out of Phoenix. Um, really delighted to have her with us and share her insights uh, as she is right in the throes of much of this right now. Henry DeVries, of course, our long-term friend of the family, uh, author at Forbes.com, uh, CEO of Indie Books International. Uh, again, great to have uh, Henry's perspective today. And of course, Kendra Andrew is rejoining us, our returning champion from Via Technologies, uh, to really talk more about strategic alignment and has a great case study for us to look at. Um, on this session, as you've already noticed, uh, for those that came in via the Zoom link, you're able to see and interact with us um, via chat and via Q&A. Please use that. However, this is not to be used for personal agenda bomb bombing. You know Zoom bombing? There's no personal agenda bombing on this, meaning uh, throwing up your own links and sharing what your business does. Uh, it's not that kind of meeting. Um, we do, however, want your questions to these speakers um, so we have a great dialogue about what this process is all about. Okay, Mike Tyson, his perspective on strategic planning. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? Um, and that is the real problem here is that most leaders say they've got a strategic plan. They conduct strategic planning but less than 10% actually do it or actually execute to it. Uh, so the real question for today is, why do we even want to talk about strategy to begin with? It becomes an exercise for most companies of moving the deck chairs around the Titanic. That is, you know, we're going to look pretty here, we're going to get things organized, but nothing's really going to happen. The other issue we're up against now that we didn't have two years ago was the fact that uh, we've been in uh, the midst of this pandemic. We've got a risk across our entire workforce, across all of our talent, in what we called learned helplessness. That is, they've been subjected to restrictions and guidelines and everything else that's actually encouraged them to withdraw more, become more self-centered, more isolated, than working as a team. And we're seeing this across the board, no matter the size of the company, misconnects, miscommunications, projects uh, failing to be on time. You've seen it as a customer um, when you interact with these companies. So this idea of learned helplessness, helplessness is something we've got to overcome now. And another reason to pull the team together right away. Um, we do have a vision for the brighter future as I was looking at the window from our UCI offices the other day. So there's, there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, and we do have a brighter future in front of us, but we've just got to be crystal clear about what that is. So I want to be clear here about the strategic planning evolution, because I think many people are operating in the past under the strategic planning mantra. And it's no longer that. The old days of strap plans and elaborate goals and objectives and lengthy three to five year to 10 year projections, uh, they're still there, but that's just an underlying foundation for the real work that has to take place. And that is strategic alignment. 
which Kendra will talk about in their case study, building strategic capabilities as Susan is doing with her entire talent base, the skills and capabilities are necessary. And finally, this idea of strategic agility, that is what we ultimately are after. How do we penetrate markets? How do we anticipate customer needs? How do we become a key part of our market ecosystem? That is really where we're going. Uh, so what are CEO concerns right now? This is what we've been hearing over the past several months. Number one is burn rate, uh, obviously is still there, even worse. Culture, building a culture that's gonna support where you wanna go. And finally, this hard focus, customer centricity. Uh, what value shifts have happened? What buying patterns have changed over the past 24 months? So the CEOs are telling us this, they want to know what they can do now to rework, reinvent, recover, rebound um, in 2022. And some of them, I love, love the Shawshank uh, example, using that small claw hammer to break through the barriers to get through to a brighter other side here. So again, it's this kind of constant work against it. From a prescriptive standpoint, here's what we're talking about. Again, our focus today is on the strategic retreat, right? So typically these things are one to three days. And in today's environment, most of them are gonna be in-person and virtual. So you're gonna have this kind of hybrid environment. Um, you're certainly gonna have your core team that you're looking at, the entire executive team. You may have high potentials that participate, although there's some companies out there that don't like to segment out high potentials. They say, let's get everybody in. Let's be as inclusive as we can from different levels of the organization to make sure different aspects of our organization are represented. Having a customer representative there, either videotaped or some way you can bring the customer into the room. You know, the famous Jeff Bezos technique of leaving an empty chair to signify the customer, it's not the empty chair. We want the customer in the room with us as we're talking about strategy, if we can. Um, remote locations uh, in a hybrid format, how do you bring an element of physicality and connection to a remote audience? So we have something called a strategy in a box where we send physical elements of the organization, whether it be product services or what have you, into the hands who, of the people who are not in the room with us during the strategic retreat. That physicality is important. And then finally, how do you plan in what we call blue sky breaks? That is, how do you get outside the formal session so people can have these informal dialogues? And I'll explain why that's so important here in a minute. So again, it's kind of back this routine where we're giving people some structure, but not too much process, allowing them to ideate all elements of the organization, all people, so we get the best and brightest ideas out there. As you're looking at designing the strategic retreat, there are a couple of things I want to bring up. I can't go through all these, but the advantage of an in-person session, as you know, is more rapid fire collaboration. What you also get is the random collision of ideas. You go to lunch, you go to the cocktail party after the meeting, people getting together and have these great insights and collision of ideas that are not possible in a Zoom meeting. Now we can capture some of this uh, today in a Zoom meeting, but it's not quite the same. How do you create this environment where these different ideas can percolate up and people can connect? Another one here, how do you create emotional connection to your strategic intent? You're setting the context with the retreat, but how do you create that emotional connection and passion for where you're going? The other one I highlighted here was the hallway conversations of truth. And you've been there. So you have a strategy session and then someone walks up to you, pulls the CEO aside and says, you know what, this is the wrong direction or this meeting isn't going quite like we need to be going. Those kind of moments of truth are not possible in a Zoom meeting. You're not going to pull the CEO out of a Zoom meeting to, to have that conversation. How do you do that? And one of our board members, by the way, said this is the, uh, the meta conversation that somebody should have had with Mark Zuckerberg. But anyway, that's aside the point. These are kind of things we need to be thinking about as we design the, or the session itself. So a couple of things we also want to think about in the strategic retreat. One is to explore, search for ways we can increase the value proposition of our existing business model, maximize expected returns, and become a key member of the market ecosystem. 
Um, second, exploit the existing business model so we can rapidly grow. Um, again, how do we scale our existing business model appropriately so we can, again, further minimize risk and grow? So explore, exploit. That's a constant conversation during these retreats. Innovation mindset, going into these retreats with this uh, idea that we are going to innovate all aspects of our organization. I'm just going to pull up a couple of these. One is innovation typically comes out from outside your industry domain. We can do it internally, but also we want to be sure to look outside to our customers and look at our competitors uh, and even other industries for new ideas that may be coming up. So what are the emerging trends and potential new value propositions that other industries are coming up with and what implications does that have for us? How do we think like a startup? How do we go back to small again? When we were just two or three people with this great business idea and this great value proposition, how do we retain that, that mindset and that level of collaboration and that level of nimbleness as we grow as an organization? How do we ideate better? Uh, and here's a few of the techniques we use in these strategic retreats to help, help that along. Um, improving decision-making, accelerating decision-making. How do we tap the collective intelligence across the whole organization, top to bottom, and including our customer? So we're using different techniques during the strategic retreat to make that happen. One of the techniques we found that's most powerful, and again, just really highlighting this for you, uh, by the way, we will send a slide deck in this recording to you later. One of the techniques we've used successfully over many, many years, hundreds of companies is the idea of developing next practices. That is ditch legacy thinking, ditch old practices, policies, behavior that we've had in the past and relook at it. The first thing you do is free up your organization. That is eliminate the things that no longer make sense. Legacy policies, practices that just cost us money, time and resources. What can we take off the table? What can we create that will take us into new markets what new capabilities can we build that will help support that drive toward new markets? And what kind of culture that will support all of that? Answering those four questions will take you a long way. Here's a case to example I'm just gonna do in 30 seconds with the city of Irvine that has 1900 employees, one of the most innovative cities in the country. We took them off site uh, a few months ago to completely relook at their business model and how they deliver services to the city itself. Uh, out of that team, you can literally see it on the walls there. They came up with hundreds of ideas in just half a day. Um, about 80% were actionable. Uh, in this case, they looked at some of their HR practices and came up with literally dozens of new ideas that could implement right away. And out of this, Mayor Khan of the city is creating their own um, innovation center and innovation council. All right. Uh, the other way to stay on track, of course, is building your plan itself to document it and go forward. Here's the traditional plan. I'm only bringing this up because as we build a plan and we capture the data, uh, old school way was this went in a McKinsey type blue book. New way is this is tied into our technology. So it's real, it's flexible, it's adaptable, and everyone can see it. It's no longer the binder that goes in the CFO's drawer, never to be seen again. All right. Um, with that, I want to uh, segue into another case example with Kendra. And uh, Kendra, I'm going to bring you up, and we really want to hear about your experience with strategic alignment um, with Vient Technology. And I'm going to stop share here and bring you up. All right, perfect, good deal. Well, hello, Welcome. everybody, and probably good evening and really good morning to some of you. So I know you've got, this is a fun global audience. So I am going to share my screen here and I'm gonna walk you through some things that we've been working on at Viant Technology. So I have a feeling when I pull this up as a slideshow, we're gonna see here. All right. Um, so just for context, so Scott, great intro, and it's interesting. I've I have many years as an uh, and as, as HR executive and 
a business partner to uh, executive leaders. And so I'm very um, experienced and working closely with our typically our CMO and um, and our presidents or executive leadership C-suite to uh, look at annual kind of strategic planning every year, um, in addition to just talent planning. So some of the things, Scott, that you've talked about around that what would be included in that executive treat, retreat, I just want to set context that I'm working with a um, team of leaders that have worked together for a long time, and we have also some new executive leaders. So rather than keep rather than opening up our executive treat to a broader group for us, this was really a team building opportunity, which was in person, um, you know, in a COVID environment, certainly we were safe, but it was really important for us to be together in person. So just recognize that that this was uh, definitely kind of a first um, for Viant, but also very intimate to start with as we were just kind of building um, and aligning as a leadership team. So um, Viant Technology, by the way, is we're an advertising technology uh, company, um, very kind of very niche uh, domain in the digital advertising space um, with a, a group of uh, entrepreneurs and co-founders that have worked together for a long time. Viant owns MySpace, so that's kind of like our claim to fame. Um, but again, like I said, this team hadn't really gone through, you know, kind of formal strategic planning. And um, when they did, the conversations went sideways and, you know, really felt like it wasn't fruitful time. So um, coming into the organization being new, uh, I really saw an opportunity with a new and existing leadership team to hit the pause button. Um, we're growing about 30 percent uh, year over year. So we have a lot of new executives and a lot of new hires. And that causes challenges around alignment, especially when we're in a hybrid remote environment so that um, to communicate what clearly are um, our strategic imperatives and to align all of our employees so that from top to bottom, there's a real sense of purpose and that we're brokering our uh, limited resources in the right direction. So um, everything starts with vision um, and values. And um, you know sometimes that's tough to kind of get leaders to kind of sit down and say, really, what is our vision and what are we trying to achieve in the next two to three years? So we spent some time separately with our co-founders developing what is the roadmap for the next two to three years. We presented that to the team. Um, and then we used um, a pretty rigid format just to have some freedom, I guess you might say, within the framework, but we needed a framework to be efficient with our time and with our planning. So I'm going to walk you through what that looks like, but really this was around aligning on um, annual objectives as a leadership team with inner department, um, you know, uh, dependencies. So recognizing that everybody can't just go back in their departments and their silos and do their work um, because we all know in organizations that, um, you know, there's puts and takes and there's dependencies and there's all of us are affected by the outcomes or the inputs um, across an organization. So that alignment at a leadership standpoint was super important and uh, certainly to get clear on strategic initiatives. And the outcome of talking about those strategic initiatives is really an opportunity to pull in hypos and other key leaders to help drive those strategic initiatives. I do also have, Scott, if you're interested, a uh, um, project charter. So we did very similar to what you um, showcased there, um, but we also are um, creating project charters to help again, just with um, help with just some a framework around strategic initiatives. So I'll send that to you as well. Um, so with that, so we what we did is we said, we're gonna spend a day together um, and we're gonna spend a day together. We did some team building. So we had somebody come in and do DISC. You could use any assessment you want. That was just fun for us just to spend an hour and a half having fun, getting to know each other and kind of teasing each other about how we approach work and decision-making and communications and the paces at which we operate because we all are different. Um, so that was a great way just to get the team just to kind of bond and reconnect. Um, and then we spent some time really reflecting on um, our three-year roadmap and having each department head, so every all of us report into the C-suite, but having each of us really present what are our strategic focus areas for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and some of that was even just like, what's our purpose um, in the organization? Um, what are our key initiatives and objectives? And who do we need to depend on in order to make that happen? Um, and that seems silly to do that, but that's where you start to see that interde um, interdependency. And then the final piece is really agreeing on a cadence of collaboration and communications throughout the rest of the year to keep this going. And I'm gonna share with you just high level what that system of engagement and alignment looks like outside of a strategic planning process. 
Um, so these are just some sample slides. And again, we'll share this with you, but we gave four slides. Sounds really basic, but that's a little bit of real estate to put your whole game plan out there on four slides. So you can imagine that the preparation um, and also a little bit of the anxiety with our leadership team on how do we do this? But, and by the way, each person only had 20 minutes to present their plan uh, with some dialogue. And you would be surprised that we actually got through this plus more in one day, but this is just the discipline. And, and, um, and we did actually do a dry run and review um, everybody's presentations before coming into the meeting. So um, the first thing for us, especially as we're scaling as an organization, is just to hit the pause button. And from our perspectives, like what are the most important objectives for um, Viant post IPO, um, high growth, um, acquired and organic? You know, what does that mean for us in terms of the type of scale we need within our departments and how we need to work together? So this is just one example from an HR kind of standpoint so that you can see high level um, but enough to really kind of generate some dialogue and each one of us had three points three main you know kind of points across each of these areas what are the company's most important goals from our perspective how do we contribute to the company's success and then what are the three main priorities for our department in the next 18 to 20 or 12 to 18 months um, then we went through the next slide, which is really those strategic focus areas, the key objectives or initiatives, and then key results, which is really the what by one or how we're going to measure this, and then who will help drive this. So this is like the basic beginning of thinking about OKRs for an organization like ours that hasn't really done um, robust like planning and even driving down goals to our employees. This is just the beginning. But again, like I said, to get all of this real estate, you know, in one page is um, that's the benefit, I think, honestly, of doing this process is because you have to kind of kind of boil it down in a way that is um, palatable and understandable. So for us, as part of that, you know, kind of growing our organization and really thinking about the culture and our values and, you know, kind of how we want to operate and treat our talent. As an organization, again, these are just examples from my playbook around we're a people first organization. We're purpose driven, um, people focused, and um, creating a great place to work is super, super important to us. And so these are some of the things that are important. Um, these are some of the ways that we're going to measure it as a public company, ESG, and understanding corporate social responsibility and diversity ties into that. And so you'll, you know, you can kind of see like who drives it. And you like right now, there's a lot of committees. So you've got departments and then you've got committees that are really representative of what I would call a networked organization, which is really important if you think about how work gets done um, in today's environment. So the other pieces that we put together, the other two slides, one was just around what is the support that each leader needs? So what is the support that each leader needs to achieve their objectives? This is just a template with some prompts for the teams to think about. This honestly becomes a truth telling um, session because there's things that come out around, we have major gaps or we're not getting what we need out of XYZ department. And we need that in order for us to really accelerate our conversations with our customers. So when you have multiple departments that are kind of saying similar things, it helps all of us think about what are the things that are most important or what are either opportunities or gaps that we need to focus on to help us be more successful. And then the last piece that we did, similar to what, um, what Scott had talked about around innovation, is um, think about what is one big idea? What's something, whether it's specific to your department or just for the company overall, what's an idea that's really going to help accelerate our growth? Um, and then what are, how does that link back to either what our business problem is or what we're trying to solve or what it would take to actually make it happen? We got really basic ideas and we got some that were really good big ideas. But what was cool is that each of us shared this with our teams um, before coming into the meeting to say, what is it? I only have one big idea. And of course, as you know, everybody comes with like, well, I actually have three ideas. <laughs> so um, but we try to really limit everybody to share your, their one main idea. Um, and then when we debriefed at the end of the day, these were things that we were able to kind of also double click on around, are these strategic initiatives or are these things that we all agree on that are key investments or some things that we need to look at, you know, to kind of build for the future while we're also focused on our near-term near objectives. 
So that's basically the template. And like I said, you'd be surprised how much you can get through in 20 minutes per person and leaving time for dialogue uh, on top of that. So the outcomes are huge. These are just some examples of some of the outcomes um, for us as we kind of started to think about what are our new ways of working? So this is really just an idea around a, a networked organization and thinking about how you can leverage strategic initiatives or projects to drive engagement but also solve real world problems that bring in diverse thoughts and perspectives from across the organization. So this is where that project charter is helpful because it gets you to start to think about what really are we trying to accomplish through this project and who are the right people to bring in. And I've even had an opportunity as I'm reviewing some of the charters, like it's really top heavy. Who are the doers or who are the workers that we want to make sure are involved in the project from the get go because it's a huge change management opportunity as well as an opportunity to bring in high potentials um, into into the work that needs to get done. Just as a side note, and I know we all probably feel this um, as a result of COVID and working remote, but there are studies that have been done that um, company internal networks of um, employees within companies have actually been reduced as a result of COVID because we don't know who to network with outside of our immediate departments or maybe a connection that we've you know kind of made through a boss or just through you know kind of your normal day-to-day -day working so the idea of like that office you know kind of the um, the water cooler or getting a chance to meet people that you wouldn't normally work with it's not happening naturally right now in a remote environment and again strategic initiatives are one way to combat that uh and then the last I think, let's see, why is this not going down to the next slide? There we go. Okay, so then back to looking at, um, you know, kind of company alignment. You know this, but this is why it really is important, right? So company priorities will align. We're not cascading because um, different people are going to be involved in different initiatives. And the most important thing for us is that we just have that alignment. Um, across our organization and down through our organization. So that goal alignment, that transparency, KPIs that can be shared or kind of progress updates as part of like town halls or employee updates are really important. But we've heard from our employees that they want to feel connected to our purpose, um, what their purpose and their role is and how that connects to the broader success of the organization. So this just kind of starts to show systematically how we can look at strategic alignment and engagement. Um, to really make this happen. So here's just an example of kind of what a system might look like. And I'm super excited because Henry's going to share more around communications, but this is really the discipline around communication and culture when you've got that alignment and you've got, you know, kind of all of these support systems from weekly staff meetings to um, coaching and one-on-ones with employees to all hands meetings. What are the agendas for those all hand meetings? As a matter of fact, we already scheduled all of our all hands meetings for the entire year. So that's just the commitment and the cadence and people know our employees, our leaders know um, what's coming down the pike so that we're all prepared <clears throat> for those conversations. Quarterly business reviews. Um, we're also including all of our leaders at a certain level and hire to participate in those quarterly business reviews. So again, there's more transparency and more ownership um, in driving the success of our organization. Talent planning is critical. So succession planning is something that we have in our mid-year process. As we look at our mid-year results, we'll also look at talent. Um, as part of that as part of that business review. So again, these are just examples. Um, you can tell I'm passionate. I've seen great success. And um, and again, you know, this is a new organization where I've been before with very established organizations just to hit the pause button and have the leadership team come together um, is time that is just so well spent. And um, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir with this group. So um, super happy to have the opportunity to share this with you. And uh, so with that, Scott, I think I'm going to give it back to you or to Henry. OK. Uh Thanks very much, Kendra. Sure. Great, great example. You know, you bring up a couple of things too. And uh, uh, again, this is kind of the gold standard model that you portrayed to us. And again, you've been through this with uh, very large scale organizations and uh, as well. So you you kind of know how to, the process goes. Uh, and you also know when to bring in a facilitation to help get, get that going. But you also brought something else up and that is that this is a highly customized approach. Uh, one size does not fit all, because I'm sure you would not have used this approach in a different organization, which is really a point here. 
It's the opposite of what we were all taught in B school, that we all look alike and we all should operate alike. Not at all. Uh, you should have something that's highly customized to your own organization that will take you forward. So Henry, we, um, we talk, uh, Kendra talked about communications. Can you kind of illuminate a bit on this as well? Um, take us through what, what it's gonna take to, to get people charging up the hill behind us? Thanks for inviting me to talk about communicating the retreat. So can you see the slides? That's always the big question. Not, not yet, not yet. Not yet, okay. Let me, uh, let's just make sure we've got you uh, in a position to fully do that. So. There we go. Okay, and now. So the year was 2019. The place was Detroit, Michigan. And there was a national food wholesaler. Sandra was the vice president of sales and marketing. And she wanted to be sure that she could communicate to all their business development reps what was happening from the retreat and where they were going forward. And I was invited in, I had a half day of the three day event to show them that these are emotional times that uh, we live in. They're even more emotional now. If we're talking about what's different in 2022, we're even more emotional. And research in neurosciences has proven that people don't make decisions with the logical part of their brain they make decisions with the emotional part of the brain. So the question is, how do we tap into that emotional part of the brain? The answer is storytelling and a certain type, a certain type of storytelling. And we've talked about culture and this being part of the culture. Well, stories are what shape culture. I travel around the country, I meet with CEOs, I'm a speaker for Vistage International, I, I know some of you are familiar with that organization. 23,000 CEOs, peer-to-peer -peer groups, also key employees, key vice presidents. That's where Sandra had heard me speak. At, at one event in North Carolina, a, a CEO came up to me, he was very proud, and he said, Henry, I gotta tell you, I know you talk about core values, my company has 22 core values. I said, oh, wow, that's, uh, well, first off, a lot of core values. Um, second, do you have a story for each core value? And he goes, no, we don't, we don't have any stories. I said, well, maybe that's something we need to unpack. But the first thing is I look for the core values, what, what's coming out of that strategic retreat that you want to communicate. So. For this national food wholesaler, their core value was whatever it takes to solve the problem. So I helped them mine a story. I, we don't invent stories. We're not talking fables or, or made up stories. And it's a story that should take two minutes to tell. And it builds your trustworthiness. It makes a point in two minutes or less. So for that core value, I helped Sandra with this story. I'd like you to meet Chef Jeff. Now this national food wholesaler, they have three clients, casinos, universities and colleges, and prisons. I'm not exactly sure what they have in common, but that, that seems to be their target audience. Well, Chef Jeff was a chef at a casino in Michigan. He was a go-getter, uh, he was really passionate about the company. He wanted to do great things, uh, but he, he had a little undeserved misfortune. Chef Jeff wanted to fill the, the big dining room with 150 couples for Valentine's Day. So he advertised a $29.95 lobster dinner for two. Sold out in advance. 
and then the undeserved misfortune. There were some problems with the lobster industry up in Maine and in Nova Scotia, and lobster prices skyrocketed. So he's going to lose money on every couple that comes in for the lobster dinner. Well, you know, you don't get ahead in that game by losing money. So he came up with an idea. He says, uh, you know, what I'll do is uh, people also like shrimp scampi and I can get a good price on shrimp. So we'll just substitute shrimp scampi dinners. So he goes to the general manager at the casino and tells him this great idea. And the general manager says, what, are you nuts? Are you crazy? You're gonna do a bait and switch with people on Valentine's day? Not only, they're gonna tear the place apart. They're not gonna gamble. They're not gonna you know, be happy with us. So that's when Chef Jeff went to Pam, his rep at the National Food Wholesaler. And most food wholesalers would say, well, here's the price of lobster. You know, we don't control that. Pam knew that the core value was do whatever it takes to solve the problem. So she researched the lobster industry up in Maine and found out something interesting. When they process lobster tails, sometimes things go wrong and, and tails break. And you can't sell a broken lobster tail for the same price you can a pristine whole lobster tail. Well, they don't throw them away. Uh, they sell them at a discounted price. Well, that wouldn't solve Chef Jeff's problem. So she had her own in-house chef create recipes that you could take the broken lobster tail and present it and serve it in a creative way and a delicious way. And that's what Chef Jeff did. And he made a profit on every dinner. Um, the casino had great receipts that night because of all the happy diners who stayed around. And I like to think 150 couples found love because of this food wholesaler and Pam. Okay, that's the story. Um, where do we tell it? Well, we certainly tell it to prospects. We want them to know that this is our core value and what we stand for. They told it to job candidates to tell people what kind of firm. And we all know it's a competitive market. Top talent has a choice on where they want to go. It's not necessarily just the money you're offering them. They want to know what kind of organization they're joining. Also employees for training and rank and file. Um, I've done this at other places. Uh, an Atlanta paint contractor had the, after the retreat, they wanted to communicate that, you know, we do whatever it takes to get the job done. And I mind a story about how a foreman, a 1099 employee, by the way, not a W-2, but he rallied the troops to work over Thanksgiving weekend so that a promise they'd made to a client that this could open. And it was undeserved misfortune again. Um, the construction company that they subbed for was late and didn't turn the building over till Wednesday night of Thanksgiving weekend. And they had promised the client that they could move in Monday after Thanksgiving. And these, this uh, wand, the foreman rallied the troops and it was a great story. Um, I did ask the CEO, I said, oh, you know, when Juan rallied the troops and they were working over Thanksgiving, did you come out with like pizza and beer and reward everybody? And he said, no, I, I didn't do that. I said, it would have been a better story if you had. Okay, so let me just recap. Uh, these stories reinforce core values and there's three characters. There's a, the, the client, the prospect who you're helping. This was the casino in the Chef Jeff story. There's a nemesis. Well, the nemesis, uh, there's two nemesis characters in that story. One is the undeserved misfortune of lobster prices spiking. But it was also the casino general manager who would have keelhauled uh, Chef Jeff if he'd done that. And then the mentor character, that's where you come in, your organization, you're the voice of wisdom and experience. It was Pam. Pam did whatever it takes to solve the problem. So you also always want to give the moral of the story. If you think the Aesop fable of the, the tortoise and the hare, if I asked everybody right away, you would probably say slow and steady wins the race. So we tell stories with purpose and our purpose-driven stories 
can communicate what's coming out of this strategic retreat in a way that will reach the emotional part of people's brains. Because if I give you one message that's so important, I'll give you this one. Human brains are hardwired for stories. With that, I'm gonna uh, turn it back to Mr. Scott. Henry, thanks so much. Uh, great perspectives as always. And as you know, the stories are what sticks with people the longest um, out of the coming out of these strategic retreats. Those are the ones they carry forward, not the, not the dry stuff like the numbers. But thank you so much for that perspective. Let's bring up Susan. Susan, delighted you could join us today uh, from Radius AI. And uh, great to see you again. Look forward to seeing you again very soon in Phoenix. Um, so share with us uh, some of these perspectives on talent uh, and execution. And you, you've, you've been in that seat now for a while, right in the midst of it. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks, Scott, for having me. And, and Kendra, I love what you said, the word alignment. And for those of you who are here in the chat, you know, I'd love to hear something that you heard from Kendra or from Henry, um, who I admire both deeply, something you can actually, you know, something that you can take as an action item because all time has an ROI as we're all aware. And so when we're here at a virtual event or doing a retreat, the question of is it's this give and take. So if I'm away from my family or away from my home or whatever, and I'm somewhere, what can I take as an action that can go and create change? So as uh, Scott mentioned, you know, I'm in the midst of it and I'll talk a little more about radius in just a minute, but I'm excited that um, you're all here and taking this time, which is outstanding. And uh, I've got a, a, just a few slides. So I want to begin just with, you know, picking up on something Henry talked about, about uniting the core values. And I have been in business for almost 30 years, and I've had the privilege to work with multi-billion dollar multinational companies and startups and solopreneurs. And the biggest thing I've observed is that a company that is in growth and momentum is always united, if you're taking notes, on a common cause that is centered around core values. So my question is, is your business centered around a common cause that is united around core values? So I have a really good friend. He had a substantial exit from a company. It was $300 million. It was him and three co-founders. And the, you know, at first they were just so all about market niche and serving and they were so aligned. And then what happened to quote the great Will Smith, who says, money doesn't change who you are, it only amplifies what is already there, that as they got closer to potentially exiting, people's true colors came out. And so some founders were very, very focused on continuing to provide value. Another founder was, let's expand market share. And another one was like, let's exit. So there started to be a lot of infighting. The um, company began to implode and my friend came in like the superhero and saved the day and got the exit. And they didn't speak for a couple of years. And so the reason I share that story is that you're either growing together or you're growing apart. And that's the purpose when you do these retreats. And Kendra, you know, talking about um, MySpace, one of my, my closest friends is Jason Pfeffer, who is a co-founder of MySpace. So I've intimately been a party to those early MySpace stories and I'll be having dinner with Jason this coming week. And I love what you're doing and the simplicity of it. And even though I have access to your slides, I took a screenshot because if you can dial it down to one page, I mean, how powerful is that, right? So I wanna talk about something that we're all hearing about and maybe take a different opinion on it. So I pulled some news articles, um, the great reimagination of work, why 50% of workers wanna make a career change, 50%, okay? Now, as Scott said, people don't remember stats, but I want you to, I wish I could give a prize to whoever remembers these because it's, it's quite funny. And then we hear 95% of workers are thinking about quitting their jobs according to a new survey. Burnout is number one. And then, then it's three quarters. So is it 50%, is it 95%, is it three quarters? Here's what we know. It's confusing, 
right? <laughs> Would you all agree? If you are a manager, if you are a founder, even if you're a solopreneur, you're talking to friends, you know, who are contractors or whatever, we're hearing some very confusing numbers. And these are big publications putting out this information. And so, you know, it, it really leads me to wonder, especially as a, um, a you know, a, I'm a, a unicorn in the sense that just so you're all aware, only 2% of tech companies in the United States of America have at least one female founder. Only 2%. So I'm in that 2%. And it's hilarious because if you look at my Crunchbase profile, I'm one of the leaders in terms of being a woman in machine learning and AI. And my undergrad degree is psychology. I don't care. You know, <laughs> just tell you, right? So my friend and I were laughing about this last night at my daughter's track meet. It's so funny, you know. So my point being is that here we are, it's very confusing. There are a lot of people that think this is, you know, things are gonna get back to normal. Okay, once we release mandates and things, they will get back to normal. My Vanguard opinion is this, we are not going back to normal. And so you might be wondering, what makes you think this, Susan? So I'll share a little bit of perspective. So this is a photo of me and Merrick. Merrick is one of our um, students. He's an Arizona State University student, but we just hired him full time. He's an outstanding human. And so we're in one of our radius offices. I call it the gold chair office. And these, I was like, Merrick, let's do boss face. So this is us doing boss face. So a little bit about radius AI to give you perspective. So. We are an artificial intelligence company in the computer vision space, and we specialize in the retail and healthcare sectors. We are currently deploying a thousand location deployment in over a dozen states in the United States in the retail sector with a national retailer. So when you know we started this company, I helped to co-found the company. I came on board in 2018. And initially it was, oh, Susan, you're so good at raising money. I come from a sales pedigree. I've built award-winning sales teams totaling over 2 billion US in sales and three separate verticals. And oh, come help us raise money and help us bring in deals. It'll be a lot of fun. And I was at a point in 2016, I had gone on a trip to Africa. I've been to Africa many times. I got very sick. And to make a long story short, I ended up getting an amoeba. It was shutting down my organs. The do three doctors said you should have died. And I had that moment and I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm in the shadow of 50 and my organs are shutting down. And I feel like there's something I'm not fulfilled in my career. I love being a mom. I have five kids. I love my husband, but there's something missing. So I decided to go back into technology and I hadn't been, I hadn't written a line of code since 1992. I grew, grew up um, coding video games in the 80s. Then in university, I was coding. We were working on early crime scene quantification. A later version of that software was used by Quantico. And keep in mind, I have a psychology degree. So it doesn't matter what you're trained in. It's what you decide you're passionate about, right? So there I am and I meet these guys, become a co-founder. It went from let's raise money. We raised $7.1 million in seed funding. And then it was like, okay, you know, helping them to, you know, bring in the first deal. And I thought, oh, then I'll go and do something else. Well, here I am four years later, I was vice president of communications, then vice president of marketing. Then I became the president. Then I became the co-CEO, which I share with my amazing friend and uh, wonderful partner, Aiku Dengi. And and you know, so now we are we're doing this deployment, and just to give you a perspective of where Radius is year over year, we have four times the full time staff that we did at this time last year, four times. And so now we have offices in Phoenix, offices in Bellevue, Washington. Um, we have contractors who are overseas on three different continents. I have employees all over the United States and we're in massive growth and we're every single day in my email, there are offer letters going out and it's crazy. And there, are, I walked into the office the other day, there were two employees, I didn't even know who they were. And so in this massive growth, stage, there's been a lot of learning. And the thing I want to say is when you are starting a company, that is the best time to have someone like Kendra 
at your helm. That is the best time to start thinking about with your core team, strategic retreats. And here's why it goes back to what I said. When you initially start something, you're so excited. It's like getting married, right? No one gets married and thinks I'm going to get divorced. No, you, you get married and you're aligning your core values. There's maybe some give and take, but then things can start to fall apart. Marriage is hard. I'm going to say that business is hard. 90% of tech startups fail. It's hard, but what makes them fail? Is it lack of cash flow? That's one of the top reasons. If the reality is, especially when there are more than you know one or more founders, is that in partnerships, when your core values don't align, that's when the problem happens. So for us, you know, the you know at Radius, we have a lot of conversations, and you know, behind closed doors, it might be like, what the heck are you thinking? But we'll always have this united front, and and we don't leave a meeting until we are aligned. We don't leave a meeting until the there are three founders, myself and um, two others that run the day to day operations and we'll get in a Zoom and we'll just, you know, get to the point where we're all agreeing. On, it could be Monday night at seven o'clock. It could be early in the morning, but we have to be a united front. And the thing I'm going to tell you, because we're hiring um, university kids, we're hiring interns. Do you know how much interns in tech get paid these days? Like. Oh my gosh, we're talking six figures as a tech intern who is a second year student. It's insane what they're getting paid and they're demanding it. I saw an email come through. Um, we had given someone an offer and they came back and they're like, well, I would like, and it was like close to $10,000 a month as a summer freaking intern. I said freaking Scott. So I hope that I'm a little passionate about this. So we have this demand where you have younger people demanding more money. You have people like myself who are sort of like, you know, I'm turning 50 this year. So we're, you know, really crushing it in our career. And um, as women, and I'll just be very candid, you know, enough's enough. We want to get paid uh, what our male counterparts are getting paid. And so at Radius, um, the three core leaders, we all get paid the same thing. And so ladies, I'm pleased to tell you that we take the same bonuses. You know, we work really, really hard. And so what we're seeing with hiring is that my Vanguard opinion is this, this is not a trend. Workers are demanding different things. And this, these are three reasons why I do not feel the workplace is going to change. It doesn't matter what we think is going to happen. And I'm going to go through these super quickly before I pass it back to Scott. So we have demand for DEI, demand for hybrid flexibility and demand to feel heard. So Gen Z, so we're hiring a lot of Gen Zers, 88% of Gen Z feels it's time to change and they are demanding. It's not asking for, it's demanding to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion. And 68% of Gen Z have observed discrimination in the workplace. I'll share these slides. And 44% of them themselves have experienced it from all sides, like gender, ethnicity, race, identity, and sexual orientation. We had this amazing candidate and there were different companies fighting over her. And she chose to come to work at Radius because she said, I want a female mentor in tech and I can't find one who is in a startup in the C-suite. And so that's how we ended up getting her. We obviously had to pay her more too, but they're demanding it. They want to feel that regardless of their skin color, of their gender, whatever it is, they are included and they're demanding it. So this isn't something we can say, oh, this is a trend or, you know, this is political. This is not a trend and it is not political. If you're growing your business, and this is why I cannot emphasize this enough, Kendra and I don't even know each other, but when I was, my screen was off, I was cheering because everything she was saying, you have to figure out, you might have workers in their sixties and you might have workers who are 21 years old. How do you align them and make sure everyone's on the same page? And then number two, that, you know, we're seeing this massive trend where, you know, where people aren't going to go back to the, you know, just working in an office, almost 60% of people, they want to choose an employer who offers remote work. And so this is a survey by Slack of 9,000 workers in six countries found that 72% prefer a hybrid remote office model. So at Radius, we have engineers who are like, I just want to work at home. They used to come in the office, then COVID happened. They started working at home. And in order to retain talent, you've got to meet people halfway. 
And so we're having discussions right now. It's like we can't enforce them to come in the office, but you know, because again, if you want to attract and retain the best talent, they're demanding it and it's all being driven from the bottom up. And I mean, by Gen Z all the way up and it's not going to change. And then the third point that I want to make is that 86% of employees do not feel heard. And I certainly myself have experienced this where I don't feel heard. And and again, candidly, you know, sometimes I'll ask myself, am I not feeling hard because I'm a woman? Am I not feeling hard because I have darker skin? And what if it isn't those things? What if I have to take ownership and learn how to become a better communicator? I've shared the stage with Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield. I've written best-selling books. I've done all of this stuff. I can stand on stage in front of 20,000 people, but when I'm sitting in front of a, you know, a PhD, candidate in data science who's 26 years old and they're not understanding what I'm saying, I have to take that responsibility, right? So what are you doing to make sure your employees are feeling heard? So lastly, this is what we're learning because Scott said, Susan, this is kind of fun. You guys are in the growth stage. You're, you know, and he knows, Scott always knows, I'll just lay it all out. So here are some things we're learning. Um, we make sure employees, <clears throat> pardon me, so passionate. <laughs> um, we make sure our employees have multiple people to connect to. We remind them who they are. So multiple paths of, you know, this is how I'm feeling. We are doing monthly virtual wellness Wednesdays with topics driven by the employees. Um, because again, we have remote people. We have people in the office. We just did one yesterday on how to maximize wellness when you have minimal time. We bring in guest speakers. We're teaching our managers how to do 360 evaluations. So we're scrapping a lot of the traditional ways of doing employee evaluations. And we're kind of taking the best of the best and let teaching our managers how to let their people on their team drive those evaluations. And we're never assuming employees know. We are a tech company. We use a lot of technology just to deliver our technology. And yes, we're hiring and we're like, do you know GitHub? And do you know what Kubernetes is? And do you know all these things? But we're not assuming they know. And that's why we're just in this hiring phase, we're constantly doing new employee orientation, new employee orientation, um, anonymous wellness surveys where we send out surveys, you know, hey, how are you doing? Um, you know, essentially, are you happy? Do you feel like you understand what the focus of Radius is right now? And all of those things. And the last thing I'm going to say is, as a startup at revenue, you know, in this massive growth, that's why we are, um, you know, Scott and I are having this discussion about our first retreat because you can grow so fast that you lose sight of what it is that holds people together, the core values that Kendra spoke about, that Henry spoke about so beautifully. And when you lose sight of those things, employees are all over the map and they are going to end up in whether it's the 50%, the 75% or 95%, whatever that is true of those people who want to leave your businesses. So with that, Scott, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to you. Well, Susan, that's so powerful. I, I, it's always great to see you again. Um, again, that's just perfect, uh, perfect spot on remarks and a great, uh, great closing for us as we move on. It's also a great segue, by the way, to the next uh, event that we have that's coming up on this whole blended workplace that's coming up on March 18th, by the way. I put I plugged it in the chat there for everybody. Um, let me... Uh, just quickly, I, I want to just have the speakers come back up. So Susan, come back on. Henry, come back on. Kendra, and we're going to do kind of a fast close here, but I also want to uh, just a couple of quick things here. Um, one of the we have several questions from the audience, but I just want to one key one that keeps coming up since the topic is strategic retreats. Um, most of you are in, you're in the key seat there to drive these strategic retreats. But the question from the audience is, they're in an organization that doesn't get the value. Um, they used to do strategic planning and retreats in the years past, but now we've gone through 24 months of COVID and there's been no signal that there's any plan to get the team back together again. How do they influence up and over and out to get 
get something going um, in terms of something planning? I mean, what techniques have you been using to kind of spark it? Is it a conversation with the board? Is it a conversation with the CEO? What techniques are you using to kind of get things driving? For, I just for- want to, Scott, address, you know, something Mark said about don't survey unless you plan yeah. to act. And that ties yeah. into your question. Um, one of my friends, um, had a company where his, his several employees actually sued the company and he sat back and said i could just wind this thing down but i've got a lesson to learn he's a pretty spiritual guy and so he he started doing retreats he started doing surveys acting on them and now he has one of the top 10 companies on glassdoor which is hard to get and so to mark's point you know we do surveys at radius and we act on the surveys. And I think, you know, how do you rally people around? The first thing to sort of bring that back is give them a voice where they're feeling heard, but it's anonymous, so they're feeling safe. And if you're taking notes, I would write those two words down, heard and safe. A lot of people, and Henry would probably be much better at speaking to this than I, but a lot of people in COVID didn't feel safe. They felt, you know, they didn't feel safe for a variety of reasons. And it's up to us as employers to create a a culture in our businesses where they do feel safe. And, and that is going to take time. There's a, you know, there's an old adage, you know, for every criticism you take, it t- you receive, it takes 16 compliments to undo it. And we don't know how many years it's going to take us to undo some of the emotional trauma that people went through during covid and that you know that's why i can't emphasize enough scott bringing people back together in a way and i love what you guys do because there's a virtual option in a way they feel safe and they feel heard is so important yeah absolutely it's actually interesting scott like we um i had been pushing for a while and presenting all different types of agendas and different ways to do a strategic uh, meeting. And we actually did a survey and um, we got a lot of written comments and some of the feedback really hurt. Like as a leadership team, it was hard, Um, but we synthesized it. So just like what Steve, you know, just looking at the comments, like you have to synthesize it. We synthesized it. We did focus groups, we shared the feedback, and we committed that we were going to act on some of the key things that came up. And one of them had to do with purpose and connection. And so that was really the launching board to doing a strategic alignment meeting to get us aligned as a leadership team. Um, and then we've, we communicated that back with our employees with a lot of other things that kind of came back as a result of that. But I think you're right. I mean, you've got to do the the feed. Any sort of feedback mechanisms are important, not just one. So think about feedback loops in a lot of different ways, especially right now with the great resignation. And I, we're doing a lot of skip level meetings. Um, I, I personally am doing a lot of one on ones with our executive leadership, with my peers, with their direct reports, and even you know, kind of further down in the organization, just to kind of see where there are you know, kind of opportunities and gaps, and where there's bright points too. But those, you know, one-on-ones, keeping connected in those one-on-ones, skip levels. It's Employee Appreciation Week. Tomorrow is Employee Appreciation Day, so we're doing a ton um, around applause and um, and appreciation, also. But it's a whole system, and I think that's really for all of us. We know that, but it's up to us to really keep that system going with a variety of different um, mechanisms, um, and and it's the discipline and the cadence around it. I'll jump in too. I mean, you've given me both some great ammunition on this. Um, I'm reminded of a scripture that uh, no negative, I'm going to paraphrase, no negative feedback is ever joyous to receive, but if you use it, it can produce good fruit. And I think that's also part of being heard and the surveys and the listening. It's now more important than ever. And we need to make the case that we need to be listening. And this just is, isn't some COVID trend and we're not going back to normal. Uh, we need to go back to a better place and the retreat can help. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, I'm gonna do, so this can continue on. In fact, we've, uh, we've got our, our speaker from uh, our next session, March 18th, Mark Wilbur. Uh, who's been through the throes of these strategic retreats for a while. Uh, Mark, uh, 
Uh, we're kind of short on time, but can you kind of give us a, a one or two sentence uh, headline here on, on the challenges you've seen in the past and the reasons for doing these and, and what's, what's come out of them? Yeah, you know, the, this one of the, I always wonder how many post-it notes I've killed in my lifetime, those post-it note panels you put up on the walls and stuff, you know, probably killed a forest at this point. But, you know, I put it in the chat and thank you, Susan, for bringing that up. Uh, it, it is a critical issue. You know, we've been doing employee opinion surveys and custom designing them for better part of 40 years. We have like the normative data in there is amazing. And it's really interesting to see how some certain behaviors and feedbacks uh, haven't changed at all. And then other ones are completely different. Uh, as time has gone on. But the the one that has not uh, ever disappeared is the issue of not listening to your people. Uh, you know, the the person who says, hey, you know what, parking is really a problem here, or, you know, the, the food sucks, or whatever the hell it is. It doesn't, it, I don't care what it is. I, I don't like the paper on the, that's in the, in the office supply room. I, I don't, it doesn't matter. If you don't grab those things and address them, it doesn't mean you have to solve them today, but if you if you don't address them, then instantly the person doesn't feel heard. And then if you if you don't actually address them, not only or they don't feel heard, then probably if nothing ever happens to it, now they feel completely ignored. And I'm saying when you move from not heard to ignored, you've gone from engagement to disengagement. And so, and disengagement actually uh, undermines you know, there's a, a survey that Gallup does every year that measures disengagement, and it's in the billions and hundreds of billions of dollars that's lost by companies through disengagement because company uh, employees will actually do things to undermine the very company they're sitting in a cube at or an office at. It's unbelievable, some of the statistics here. So, you know, if, if, people don't take away anything. Susan's point about, you know, making sure that people get heard is, uh, is absolutely critical. And it, and it really doesn't, and I, and I loved um, Kendra's comment, you know, doing the focus groups and the follow-ups and feeling in, in that process and coming up with ways to get those things resolved, all critical, and, but they all create the, it, that variance that can slide in an afternoon from engaged to disengaged or from disengaged into engagement. And, and you have a choice as the leader to do something with that, or you can stick your head in the sand and pretend like it's not happening. And that will come to eventually haunt you. Um, you know, your glass door rating will be minus 1265 and um, nobody will come work for you. So uh, <laughs> not a good scenario. Well, again, again, yeah, appreciate your comments, Mark. And again, you and I have worked together on your strategy sessions in the past. And it's, uh, you know, that's a critical precursor. And we're looking forward to your comments on, on the blended workforce and some of the ways you're leveraging talent in different ways on March 18th. Yeah. Um, so again, Kendra, uh, Susan, Henry, a fantastic job. We could go all day on this. It's just really tremendous feedback. I do want to leave the audience with just a cup, quick story here. And I, if, Henry, if you'll check me to make sure you can see the screen again, uh, my full screen. Yes, we can see it. All right, I just got a quick story. We, we've been talking about talent. I don't want to forget the customer. The quick story is, have you heard of Tiny Spec? Who is Tiny Spec? <laughs> Tiny Spec is an online gaming company up in the Bay Area that was struggling for years and years. They had their strategic offsite. They couldn't, remember, couldn't figure out why they started looking at customer data and the customers were telling them, uh, Tiny Spec, you've got a great system for how you collaborate on projects. The way you talk to each other, the way you engage your team members in this online platform for creating projects. Can we buy your project software? And Tiny Spec said, that's something we created ourselves, which led to the creation of Slack. Hmm. And of course, Slack then was sold to Salesforce for $27 billion. So small things that you have in your grasp can often go to great, great things. Just don't forget that, but also listen to that customer. That's why they've got to be part of this conversation. Okay, back to our team's 90-day challenge to you. Uh, contact us if you need support. Uh, look forward to your feedback. You'll be getting an email from us this afternoon, again, with the speaker bios and an opportunity to interact with us. Um, 
Join us on March 18th uh, for the conversation with John Davern, CEO of Virtual Talent, uh, MJ Shores, uh, one of our favorites, a gig expert, gig talent, and of course, Mark, to talk about this blended workplace we all need to create. Uh, with that, thank you everyone for your patience uh, to cover all this material. Again, thank you so much, Susan, Kendra, Henry, fantastic job. Can't wait to get back together in person with you soon.